our space and take our place in the city. Jazz in Vienna, there's a collective of black and African DJs called Sounds of Blackness. They are about playing um, and dancing to music in Europe uh, by and for black people because often black cultural music in Europe is perpetuated by white European men who are kind of appropriating reggae culture and Afrobeat culture and reggae tone. And so Sounds of Blackness says we are here, we're making music, we're playing our music, we need spaces to dance to our music. And if you can see this happen, so you can understand the origins of the culture. So we're not only suggesting that we're here uh, or that we've been here, but that we're staying and that we're transferring this affirmation into digital geography. So now there's black Twitter, there's African Twitter, there's a black art contemporary blog. All over the internet, you can see affirmations of black identity through culture and art and music, right? And so it's, it's not just about place making in the city or the country you are, it's saying we go, we transcend beyond the borders. We transcend beyond physical space. Blackness is pervasive throughout all um, reaches um, of society. But this is not new, right? Making space for ourselves in the city for black people is not a new phenomenon. All these pictures of our Black Panther uh, Party, the first one is um, in Oakland, where it was headquartered, where it was founded, where they're saying we need political power as well as community power. They wanted Bobby Seale to run for mayor of Oakland. In Chicago, they wanted equal access to housing um, and not being excluded from real estate. In Brixton, in the UK, they're saying you're killing us in the streets. Black men in the UK are overwhelmingly brutalized by police. We need to be able to live in our cities and our communities safely. This has been happening throughout the world um, before decolonization, after decolonization, taking back the right to the city. So what does this mean now? How are these historical cultural expressions of resistance and activism um, currently operating, right? In uh, Brussels, they have been fighting for Stop Patrice Lumumba. Patrice Lumumba was a freedom fighter, um, president of the Congo, who along with Brussels, the CIA, and some other Western governments was assassinated, right? And now we know what the state of Congo is like. So in Brussels, there's about 98 avenues and streets dedicated to colonialism, none of which have any reference to Africa or Patrice Lumumba. Um, they had been fighting for this for 15 years, and just Monday, they inaugurated Patrice Lumumba's sign. So there's a place in Brussels now for the first time in history that acknowledges any reference to Africa or Patrice Lumumba in colonialism. In um, Vienna, last year they uh, created a space called We Day, and We Day is a space uh, founded by black queer uh, artists and activists in Vienna um, about exhibiting black art and diaspora from black Europeans specifically with a focus on queer people. Uh, if we look back to the Panthers and their 10 point plan, they said, we want community control of modern technology. In Oakland, California, with the northward expansion of Silicon Valley, gentrification, techification, a lot of people are saying, how do we reclaim technology as black communities to help us push forward and overcome these issues of gentrification? How do we use it to um, uplift our music? How do we use it to uplift our performances, our networks? Um, so we're here, we adapt, we belong here, and our history is cemented in the cities and across the globe you can see um, affirmations of blackness now on a scale that we could never see before because of technology, because of the internet, um, because the world is shifting, the demographics are shifting, and I think part of the realization that although black people might be, might be a minority in certain countries, but not a minority in the world, that understanding um, that we are a network has really allowed us to make black culture in some way mainstream and no longer just kind of underground subaltern thing. And ultimately, what I try to do with my work is um, encourage transnational networks of blackness, uh, because I think part of um, the effectiveness of structural white supremacy and colonialism is making black people feel like within their country they're isolated, there's nowhere to go, there's nowhere to look, there's no examples of alternative black futures. Um, and so I think if we have a transnational idea and a decentering of blackness, it might allow us to reimagine um, what can happen in the world in the future for black people. Thank you.
Arts Director for the Oklahoma Arts Council. In that role, I work with both urban and rural communities across the state of Oklahoma to leverage arts and culture as part of their broader community development strategies. This morning, I will introduce the concept of cultural planning related specifically to black communities, share programming examples from across the country, and end with resources for further exploration. Americans for the Arts defines cultural planning as a public process in which representatives of a community undertake a comprehensive community assessment and create a plan of implementation for future cultural programming. So, what does that mean? I believe that cultural, cultural planning is an opportunity for self-determination. Even when other resources are lacking, communities are still the source of culture. We often undervalue our inherent creativity while watching others profit by appropriating it. Alternatively, we can ask ourselves, how can we celebrate our culture to increase our sense of community pride? How can we increase quality of life for community residents of all ages? How can we attract visitors to our community on our own terms? How can we rebuild our local economies with culture at the center? How can we create opportunities for more black creatives to support themselves. Cultural planning can be used to define our own priorities and set our own agendas. It can identify and hold up assets that come from our own communities, create a guiding umbrella vision that organizes broad community efforts, explore ways that the arts can positively impact health, education, workforce development, and other pertinent community issues, Develop and document clear, formalized plans to share with stakeholders and seek investment and support for implementation. Perhaps your communities are already working on a planning process. Have you included arts and culture in that conversation? If you are looking for a place to start, have you considered starting with your cultural assets? So what are cultural assets? Well, you'll see there's a lot of things listed here, but really essentially they are the people, places, and things that contribute to the cultural fabric of a community from artists themselves, and there are artists in every community, to spaces that can be programmed and anything that makes your community unique. An effective cultural plan provides powerful strategies for improving the livability of our community. Not only does it address the needs and opportunities for artists, cultural institutions and community citizens. It easily integrates into relevant aspects of city planning, historic preservation, cultural tourism, urban design, and downtown revitalization. More broadly, taking an arts and approach, the arts can make a difference in many sectors of public life. A cultural planning process can vary in scope from focusing on a specific project or event to improving arts education opportunities developing new cultural facilities, or even a full cultural district. The following are examples of cultural programming that may, in, that may be in goals themselves, or may be building blocks in a broader strategy. Festivals are a powerful tool for cultural preservation that can also have positive economic impacts on a community by employing artists and attracting visitors, thereby boosting tourism. These images are from the Dust Till Dawn Blues Festival in Riggsville, Oklahoma one of our remaining historically black towns, which also happens to be the birthplace of John Hope Franklin. This festival is held every Labor Day weekend to celebrate the legacy of another Rainsville native, blues musician D.C. Minner, and it's actually held on the site of his childhood home and organized by his widow. Some cultural plans may include the development of public art, which is not only an opportunity to beautify a community, but is well documented to have positive effects on public safety. And the beautification itself can be a silent expression of an existing community's history, values, and aesthetic, demonstrating that a place is cared for and not for sale. We are all familiar with murals, which can be a low-cost, high-impact place to start. This image is a work by Amber Art Design in Philadelphia. However, public art may, take, may also take on many other forms. In Louisville, Kentucky, Sculptor Andrew Cousins developed the Smoketown Lifeline Project by generating dialogue with community members to understand the impact of collective trauma and to visualize the multi-dimensional impact of poverty in a new way. The project was featured in Louisville 
Metro Department of Public Health 2017 Health Equity Project, uh, Health Equity Report. And I just want to read a little bit from um, his artist statement because this to me is one of the most powerful projects I've come across in the last year. The vertical rods began straight as they stemmed from the ground. A bend or kink was put into the rod depending on when a traumatic experience occurred in that individual's life. I started by asking the person's age and measured the rod to that size. From there, I asked questions concerning the person's history of addiction, family parental issues, incarceration, mental illness, violence, and other traumatic experiences which may have prevented them from achieving their dreams or caused the individual to stray from the straight and narrow path. <clears throat> Each bin has a color associated with it, which hopefully you can see in that enlarged photo. Um, has a color associated with it and will ultimately have a colored plaque or signage nearby to indicate what sort of trauma it represents. The signage will also contain facts about each issue and statistics about the role each plays. The height of the rod, representing the age of the individual, also gets shorter with each bend. This represents the toll that it has on the overall health or lifespan of that individual. Although this visually abstract work doesn't contain any specific information about the individuals, one is able to read the work to better understand the trauma that is affecting the lives and health of the citizens of Smoketown. This project is intended to collect qualitative data that can be used to address policy change. Developed in response to the city of Chicago's need to find sustainable uses for trees destroyed by the emerald ash borer beetle, the ash project mills felled trees into lumber using locally sourced wood to provide high quality handcrafted project products. This project is the pilot of a workforce development training program that focuses on the creative industries and leverages the potential of art and design to create jobs and promote ethical redevelopment on the south side of Chicago. Residents of the Greater Grand Crossing, Woodlawn, and Washington Park neighborhoods have been hired to train with master carpenters and learn the basics of woodwork. So this is a framework that's been developed by Art Place, and this model is really helpful for conceptualizing the possibilities of collaboration amongst various stakeholders and to realize arts and cultural impact across sectors. Each box in these grids represents an opportunity. What arts-based interventions and cross-sector collaborations can your community dream? Speaking of Art Place, there's a national infrastructure in place to provide guidance and support in this work led by the National Endowment for the Arts. This federal agency is complemented by its nonprofit advocacy and research counterpart, Americans for the Arts. Art Place is a 10-year collaboration of federal agencies, financial institutions, and foundations, excuse me, working to position arts and culture as a core sector of comprehensive community planning and development. Art of the Rural's mission is to help build the field of rural arts, create new narratives on rural culture and community, and contribute to the emerging rural arts and culture movement. Springboard for the Arts is an economic and community development organization for artists by artists that works to build stronger communities, neighborhoods, and economies. I encourage you to visit and browse these organizational websites for examples of funded projects download resources, sign up for newsletters and free webinars, and become part of the conversation. Finally, I would also encourage you to connect with your home state's, with your home state's art agency if you are not already connected. Each agency is there to ensure that every community in their state receives the cultural, civic, economic, and educational benefits of the arts, receiving funding from their state's legislature as well as from the National Endowment for the Arts. Regional arts organizations, indicated here by color coding, represent another layer of support as well. Thank you.
morning, everyone. So my name is Antoinette Spillers, and the presentation I'm doing is Exploring the Political Economics of the ex Exploitation of Hip-Hop Dance in the 21st Century. And I originally wrote this paper a year ago um, in graduate school working on a dual master's in public policy at MBA, and so I'm basically applying theories from my political economy class to explain how did this happen. So, introduction. And so, um, I did a quick comparison of two different um, scholars. So, as we all know, African Americans have made much contribution to the United States, particularly um, through our cultural contribution. And so, during the construction period from slavery, um, the scholar W.B. Du Bois, he believes as though our culture contribution would allow that acceptance into mainstream society and allow Americans to finally accept and see us as human beings. Between the um, time period from W.E.B. Du Bois' statement to you know, present-day 21st century, many scholars um, have argued that, I guess, our culture has been accepted, but to some extent, and in many cases, it has been exploited. And so 21st century scholar Michelle Alexandra, she states, she argues that the current system of control currently locks out a huge percentage of African-American community out of the mainstream society and economy, which is why one of the reasons we're constantly experiencing um, economic exploitative practices in many different um, areas. So my thesis is that the lack of intellectual property rights, unstable political and economic violence, and pure public good are the three main factors that have caused the exploitation of the hip hop dance. So quick history about hip hop, because I can't talk about hip hop dance without doing a quick history lesson. Um, so first of all, hip hop dance, it is a reflection of the social, economic, and political status of black Americans. And as many of us know, it's very unique, different types of moves, pop and lock in, doing all types of intricate parts to the body. And so hip hop came about in the late 1970s in South Bronx, New York. And so I have a quick video that will, does a better job in explaining a quick history of hip hop than I could do.
And so since there was very little cost from the entertainment companies and movie productions to create these um, hip hop dance movies, they didn't invest in those dances or those crews. Um, they had significant gains. But once the two caught up with each other, um, and as the transition of Pride is good, now we're seeing the transition of how it would um, fade out in the future. And as I say, at this point, it's already been exploited, so they've made this profit. So in conclusion, um, exploitation of public goods, unstable political and economic violence, and repetitive racialized economic practices of black communities led to the exploitation of hip hop dance. And these, this conclusion could be applied to a lot of different aspects of black culture, particularly black, black business business. Um, I want to skip my limitations slide because it was, this was mostly a data paper, but there was a lot of limitations because there basically was no data. <laughs> so um, further implications, um, I think it would be great to explore the pure private goods of ballet, um, maybe do an analysis of hip hop movies from the 80s and 2000s to see what that cost looks like and hope for inflation. And also maybe look at dance movements and compare it to the social economic status of African American communities. And what can we do? We could recognize it, we could acknowledge and respect subcultures, and we need to support it and find ways to expand public policy that will protect intellectual property and other art forms that we continue to create so we could avoid um, being a burden to economic exploitation. Thank you. I am the founder of Black Space Limite, and I have done a lot of work um, trying to get the conversation of racism going in Winnipeg. Um, I don't know, have any of you been to Canada? Yes? Okay, cool. Winnipeg? Okay, there we go. <laughs> one, one hand goes up, that's fine. That's good. Um, so in Canada, uh, specifically in Winnipeg, we have this, we're really great at denying um, racism in general, but specifically anti-black racism. And uh, there's this type of societal uh, superiority that comes along with being up north. Um, we see uh, mass incarceration, shootings, um, the Black Lives Matter movement in the States, and we're like, oh, you know, thank God we don't have that issue up here and common sentiments are expressed like thank god he's not my president or i'm so proud to be canadian while denying the injustice and oppression that is imposed onto black and brown folks up north specifically uh, the genocide of uh, indigenous people um so do you know anything about winnipeg no it's cold i was gonna say <laughs> Yeah, so other than being minus 40, like eight months out of the year, oh. yeah, the struggle is very real. What? <laughs> it's like um, cold to me. Yeah. I've, I've met so many people from the South, and uh, I'm very convinced to move south of there. I can't handle it anymore. Y'all might convince me. Um, so it's located, it's located in the province of Friendly, Manitoba on Treaty 1 territory, home of the Ojibwe, Cree, Anishinaabe, and the heart of the Métis Nation. So there's a rich history um, of indigenous culture throughout Canada, obviously. Um, and it's a settlement to nearly, uh, that nearly a million people call home. So in 2011, a study done by Statistics Canada reported that the black population, and when I was looking, it was hilarious because it, it was like, it broke down other racial categories like Filipino, Chinese, um, Jewish, Turkish, and then there was just black. 
as, as you know, I wasn't too surprised, but the black population in 2006 uh, was 2.6 and it increased to 2.7 in 2011. Um, but currently, uh, I think we're just under, we, it's raised since then, but we're, I, I wanna say we're just under 4% of the general population. And we're culturally diverse with large communities, primarily from Ethiopia, Somalia, Nigeria, and the Caribbean, just to name a few. Um, but during the past few years, there's really been a shift uh, in Winnipeg. So in 2015, there was a larger conversation starting around racial discrimination and an article by McLean's Magazine, which is one of the, um, I think, major news publications in Canada, um, voted Winnipeg as the most racist city in Canada, um, specifically targeting discrimination aimed towards our Indigenous brothers and sisters. But using Winnipeg as the beacon of racial discrimination, I think, was lazy on McLean's account because the fact is, no matter where you are, white supremacy knows no border or boundaries, right? Um, and it's woven into the very fabric of our society. So as the conversation grew around anti-Indigenous racism, um, so did anti-Black racism. Specifically, a question that continued to present itself in my network was, where is the Black Lives Matter chapter in Winnipeg? We saw one pop up in Vancouver. Obviously, the incredible work that has been done by Black Lives Matter Toronto um, and even Black Lives Matter in Montreal. So the question was, where, where is this conversation happening in Winnipeg? So on July 20th, 2016, we held the first Black Lives Matter vigil in Winnipeg and to the state, the only one. And the turnout was overwhelming. I think um, for such a long time, our community um, and our city started with hopes to move the black community forward, but has stalled due to the lack of support and the unbearable pressure that comes along with community organizing and black collectives. Um, and one of our elders, Jerry Atwell, uh, identifies the struggle to keep the fire burning is due to the fact that um, it's hard to move forward as a collective since um, at times we're very divided. Specifically, the Nigerian community doesn't interact with the Ethiopian community and black folks born in Winnipeg don't interact with the Somali community. And there's, there's, a, there's an obvious division. Um, and he said, we're, the reason because of that is because we're connected by circumstance and not ideology. So that's why we're all over the place at times. And I've noticed the black movement never really dies, but it reshapes over time. So the fire might be small, but it's never really burnt out. And a lot of the work that I'm doing in the community is attempting to light the torch and keep it burning. Um, but as the pressure grew to acknowledge racism in Winnipeg, I took action. And Black Space started as an uh, online private group where I invited my friends and family just to connect, create network, heal, um, basically create any kind of dialogue around the experiences of being Black in Winnipeg. And there was a lot of uh, dialogue around racism in the workplace, um, anti-Black uh, racism at school, um, lack of diversity in our curriculum, and I think uh, Winnipeg has gotten away with that because um, throughout, from what I remember, the community, um, it's, it's really inspired by a lot of cultural activities and just one aspect of uh, acknowledging culture isn't really enough with addressing the political injustices that we face um, and, and so on. So uh, Black Space, it formed after the, the first Black Lives Matter rally uh, into a movement, and we were spreading perspectives of Afrocentrism, pro-black conversations, and creating safe spaces for people of color through hosting community events, artist demonstrations, workshops, while challenging anti-black racism and discrimination, building inclusivity across all sectors uh, in Winnipeg for black people. And since then, our efforts have been simple uh, to provide space and exposure uh, to black artists, creatives, community organizers, and anyone in our community wanting to shift the narrative um, in a positive light, obviously. And in the beginning, a lot of what I was working on was basically <laughs> educating predominantly white people that one, uh, we had a problem in our city, and two, racism and white supremacy exist throughout Winnipeg. Um, so we created a lot of dialogue uh, around challenging discrimination in Winnipeg through both conversation and art. And um, I noticed that with the beginning, um, just trying to get folks aware that there was a problem in our city, 
um, we really took it to the arts community. And a lot of it in the beginning was, I'm trying to find the video, um, was just taking up space and acknowledging our presence um, in the city. So in 2016, there's a festival in Winnipeg called Nuit Blanche, um, which essentially means illuminate the night. And it started in 2013. Ever since I, I, the inception of this organization, like you go out, you go out through the evening, and you see art demonstrations all across downtown. Um, and there was, it was, I, I'm, I'm not kidding. When there was like no diversity, there's no indigenous artists, Asian um, or black for that matter. So in 2016, I basically called them out and was like, I, I refuse to believe that there's no black artists in the city that you can't help promote. Um, or help put on the map because there's incredible um, talent in, a, in our community that's never given the proper platform. Um, and Black Space definitely tried to create that platform with our counter event called Nui Noir. Um, and it was basically an Afrocentric um, artist showcase that highlighted a lot of newcomer uh, artists from different countries in Africa um, and created space uh, just for black art and it was such it's it's so um, obvious that we're, we're, we're really missing some links uh, back home for real so um, uh, and then our second event which I'll show you the commercial um, is the Afro Prairie Film Festival and this came out of um, uh, the hope to uh, support emerging and established black filmmakers in Winnipeg across the prairies and across Canada. Um, so this was our, our first year in February. We also did to uh, celebrate Black History Month. Um, and I'll show you the... It's like one minute. Charles Burnett. Um, we brought him to do a master class and um, we dedicated um, the first, uh, uh, we had a, um, an award called um, the Winston Washington Moxtime Award and Winston was one of the first black filmmakers in Winnipeg um, who actually was quite conscious um, and his films explored um, uh, the complexity of being black in Winnipeg and really brought um, the conversation to the surface, which I think in the 90s with such a few black people, it was um, really, really effective. Um, so now black space, uh, with the work that I do, um, we, we notice that unfortunately, it can't just be art space anymore. Like we need to branch out. People are coming to us um, with creating curriculum for schools and uh, just taking up all spaces throughout our municipality. So I think moving forward, um, obviously with our, our artistic uh, and cultural programming, um, there is a need to be more um, aware of the other lack of diversity throughout uh, academia um, and other sectors of the city. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a journey and uh, definitely being at this conference has taught me a lot about community building and solidarity across uh, North America, but um, we're continuing to uh, really, really emphasize the need for uh, creating black spaces in Winnipeg because for so long they've been uh, dismantled and displaced. So thank you.
Okay, so say I want you to stand in your places and choose one or other friends. Does anyone have questions for any of the four? Oh, yeah. Thank you for your, for your presentation. And I'm interested in the question of, in, in the world of creative placemaking, there's a bit of a dilemma uh, that if the artists make wonderful work and the community becomes attractive, and then my fear is that we see happen what what happened in the South Bronx and in Queens and in Brooklyn, that these are places that were so vibrant and creative, now the artists can't afford to live there anymore. Partly because it's become so attractive as a result of the art that was created there. And I was wondering, what can we do then to, to create our art, create our work, but at the same time, keep the community from becoming displaced, sort of inadvertently as a result of the movement? So, if I may, that's why I chose
retake it as well as opportunities. And it's still, it's still not in a place where it should be because every time I submit a proposal that says hip hop in it or um, African or Afro, um, it's, it's always um, an additional extra month or two months for we need this paper, we need that. Uh, your budget doesn't look uh, sufficient.